Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, thank you so much for attending the Producers Guild of America Virtual Pride and Leadership Panel put on by the PGA LGBTQ Plus Working Group. The LGBTQ Plus Working Group is part of the One Guild Initiative supporting inclusive membership, employment, content, and depictions. My name is Melissa Nogales Chapman. I'm one of the two Los Angeles co leads for the group. I'm also joined by our newest co lead, Salvador Rios. Um, Hello. Uh, thanks, Melissa. I just want to say uh, really quickly I'm excited to be here to support you and helping to continue our PGA family. Uh, thanks for bringing me on board. Yeah. <laughs> um, and thank you again, everybody, for coming. For those of you who are not PGA members, we welcome you and we hope that you enjoy the conversations today. Um, I just have a quick little note for housekeeping before I hand over the mic to our moderator. Um, if you are a PGA member and you are not in the LGBTQ plus working group or committee and you would like to be, let me know and I will put my email in the chat so you guys can um, shoot me a quick note to join. Um, I think that's it on my end, Sal, so anything from you? Nope, uh, besides happy Pride Month. And uh, I'm excited for today's panel because I make references to the Final Destination franchise all the time. So I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> all right, thank you, everyone. Um, so in celebration of Pride Month, please join the PGA for a virtual panel conversation with Nicole Kahn, prolific independent producer, writer, and director, Jeffrey Reddick, writer, producer, director, and creator of the Final Destination franchise, and Stephen Israel. LA born, or sorry, London born, LA based, and a prolific indie producer. Uh, carving out uniquely creative careers in their own right, these, trails, these trailblazing storytellers will discuss the importance of queer leadership and the importance of representation. This panel will explore unique experiences and perspectives that shape queer storytelling. Um, this panel is moderated by David Canfield, entertainment contributor of Vanity Fair. And a quick note, unfortunately, Silas Howard had a scheduling conflict and will not be joining us on today's panel, but we will make sure to have him on at a later date. Um, and without further ado, I'll let Sal introduce our wonderful moderator, David Canfield. Thanks. David Canfield is a staff writer at Vanity Fair covering award season for the Hollywood section. He joined Vanity Fair from Entertainment Weekly where he was the movies editor and oversaw awards coverage. David is a National Arts and Entertainment Journalism Award finalist and GLAAD Media Award nominee. And he lives in Los Angeles with his husband. Welcome, David. Thank you so much for having me, Sal, Melissa. So excited to have these uh, incredible panelists here, Stephen, Jeffrey, uh, Nicole, and um, I'm really excited to get started. I've been a fan of all of your work for a long time, and I wanted to start with kind of a, a big question uh, for each of you, which is, how do you define queer leadership? Why don't we start with Jeffrey? I knew you were going to do that, David. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, I think Queer leadership is just, is, is a lot of in how you conduct yourself because I realized from a very young age, like I, I was gay when I was a teenage, of misconceptions and stereotypes that were being thrown at me. So I, I learned to be a, a good gay, I hate to say that, but you know, just somebody who was realized that I was representing more than just myself out in public. Like when I came out, people, it was a lot of the, you know, first time, the first gay person a lot of people that I worked with are new met. So for me, a lot of it's just how I conduct my own self and, and making sure that I treat people well and treat people treat people equally uh, and, and make everyone feel welcome. Um, so that's, I think for me, what's really important. Nicole, what about for you? I think for me, it's about um, continuing to do authentic stories from the heart, from the soul, uh, about women in our community and the experiences that we have um, and, you know, stay true to who we are. I've been very, very blessed to be able to do this. I'm in my 34th year <laughs> um, and um, it's about staying true to yourself as an artist, but also trying to always then uh, in that truth, speak to your fan, your film family, uh, and continue to provide them the same output product. Also for me, I've just done a reality TV show, the first uh, ever in the US, a lesbian dating competition show uh, that is 
we're streaming um, through comingoutforlove.com, but there I was able to pull together a multi-diverse, multi-talented cast of our community like people have never seen us before. And for me, that's leadership, um, even in a reality TV show. So we're very, very excited about that. Thank you. That's wonderful. And Stephen? I, I mean, I'd start by defining leadership, <laughs> which is, uh, I always think of leadership as trying to get people all marching in the same direction. But if, if you're leading, you're getting people to try and do something that's difficult. Because if you're trying to get people to do something that's easy, you're just following from in front. But so when it comes to sort of queer leadership, I think it's really just about kind of uh, trying to tell meaningful stories that um, tell uh, what's the word comment on the human condition um mm. but it, it's also about um the difficult things like you know kind of diversifying your casting diver diversifying your crewing um it, it, you know it, as i say for me leadership is about doing the difficult things um and and i guess that's that's what we have to do if, if we're going to call ourselves leaders in the community mm, absolutely and, and of course, nobody uh, enters an industry leader. They have to do some great stuff, as each of you have, to get to that point. And so I, I wanted to go back a little bit. Uh, Nicole, for instance, you mentioned uh, being in this industry for a number of years, and, and you jumped right into telling uh, explicitly queer stories, LGBTQ yeah. plus stories. So mm -hmm. I'm curious for you, as someone who wanted to make their mark in that way, what was it like navigating these kinds of spaces and uh, how difficult was it for you to break through, in a sense, to tell your stories? Um, it was uh, very, very uh, challenging for me and very confronting for me because I didn't understand uh, sort of the political ramifications of having like the first lesbian feature back in 1992, three with Claire of the Moon, that really discussed lesbianism at a at a you know current date, you mm -hmm. know, at the time that we were living then. Um, and so it's like, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, excuse me, I've got a delivery coming. Can, can okay. I? No problem. Oh, no. Jeffrey, you want to take one while we, <laughs> uh, in your case, obviously, you didn't come in, you came in a different way with a, a phenomenon, essentially. And I know you'd worked at New Line for a few years. So how did that develop? Yeah, I worked at, um, I worked at New Line for 11 years. Um, 10 years before they made Final Destination. Um, but, you know, my my career path was a little different because I, the first script I ever wrote was like an interracial gay love story. Mm -hmm. uh, and But when I got to New Line and read the coverage, it wasn't, it was just horrible coverage. Um, and I also went to New York to be an actor at first. And, you know, certainly being a, an actor of color and also being a gay actor um, in the early 90s was not just not a, a, you I didn't have the stars in your eyes and you're like oh they're not turning me down because of this and then finally my agent was like they're turning me down because of that um so that's when I shifted to writing uh and I'm a horror fan so I've always tried to infuse a, you know gay characters in my scripts but a lot of times the scripts have gotten picked up that's kind of learning the industry um picked up by somebody else and made and they degate it you know, after, mm -hmm. you know, but it's, so it's a frustrating process. Um, and it's, you know, I can certainly re relate to, you know, Nicole's, you know, it is bravery at that time. I had a friend who did Hellbent, which was like the first gay horror movie. And sure. we had the same agent and he could not get meetings after that movie. They're like, we don't watch a fag film. You know, we don't want to meet with mm -hmm. a gay filmmaker. So, um, you know, it's it's been interesting to see how far we have come but I don't think people realize, I mean, because we're going back now. <laughs> it's very, yes. very scary and stressful because we haven't, it was, the 90s wasn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, so. Even though it feels like a million years ago. <laughs> it does, yeah, but in reality, you know, we came a long way from like the 90s, mm -hmm. but now, you know, we have, didn't go that far. Like things were right. pretty bad in the 90s for, for yes. gay filmmakers, mm -hmm. you know, not to dominate just one point I'll make too is like the reason I think it's important that people you know that are feel comfortable being out or out is like when I was growing up the only gay role models I had were people who died of AIDS because nobody was out so then I would like oh Rock Hudson I would be looking at all these people 
but they were all dead. Um, mm -hmm. So I didn't have any kind of role models growing up. Um, so I, I think we don't realize just again, how backwards things were like even in the eighties, nineties um, and how they changed and how tenuous where we are now is. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was horrific back then. Um, Claire of the Moon's title couldn't even be put in the paper in Birmingham, Alabama, and it was sold out, but they would mm. not put the name of the mo movie in the time slot. Um, I just wanted to get back to the please, issues please. about, so when Claire of the Moon came out, I was just, you know, a novice. I had no idea really what I was doing. And I got hammered by the New York and San Francisco lesbians who didn't feel like it was political enough and it didn't speak to enough people and all this stuff. And I was lamb blasted um the the film ran for 18 months and then i did what i'm the most proud of which was to create mer uh, merch and ancillary for the for the first time ever with the soundtrack making of all of that stuff and we put the making of in um popcorn bins and all of the theaters where the because we only had 12 prints <laughs> we had to just keep mm. running around and that's how we we created this sort of cottage industry for seven years um, and then I went on to do, you know, a bunch of other same, same sex films, um, as well as a documentary about my son, but it's for me when, um, uh, we were talking about leadership and it's about doing the hard work it, nobody understands who doesn't do it, how hard it is to make a feature, how hard it is to do anything in this business, um, especially on the micro indie level, and especially for the lesbian film community, which is you know, a million miles away from the gay men's film community in terms of resource, what our films make, how easy it is to survive, all of that stuff. And so um, I think part of the leadership is trying to figure out how to reinvent yourself as you have to. I started out with a 35 millimeter feature. I had 35 Western Digital 250 meg uh, things mm -hmm. for, my, for my documentary. Sorry. Mm -hmm. That's my assistant. Sir. And um, it's okay. Make sure she doesn't bark anymore. Um, I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought because she came in the door. Okay. But anyway, um, oh, reinventing yourself. Uh, the 35 daisy chained, you know, 250 Western digital drives for my documentary, Little Man, to one drive, eight terabyte drive for one of my last features. It's just been a way that you've had to evolve. And then with the internet, it changed everything. It really did. And, and I took advantage of that with my fan base. So I was very happy to, to do leadership in that way as well. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, what about for you? What do you remember about uh, breaking in, so to speak? Well, I mean, I mean, my trajectory was a little bit different in that I came from kind of corporate America. Um, I was a techie, uh, and then a management consultant. And then I got hired to do tech strategy for one of the studios. And I had the world's worst boss. I mean, he was hmm. terrible from a sexual harassment perspective, from a working conditions. I mean, he just, you know, it was easy to tell when he was lying, his lips were moving. Um, and so I literally got shingles on my 30th birthday and I was like, well, this isn't good. So I uh, took, a, took a leave. Um, when you're looking for a job in corporate strategy, it usually takes you a year um, to find a job. Um, and, um, I was relatively recently out at that point as well. Um, but um, uh, so in, I wanted to find something to do while I was looking for a job. So I got an internship working for Roger Corman, um, mm. legendary B-movie producer. Um, and about six months after that, someone sent me the script of Swimming With Sharks. And I was like, oh, revenge is mine. So um, I, I put some of my business school friends together and, and, and we, we made that film. And, um, and and you, I actually did go back to corporate after that. But I mean, having made the first movie, it was <laughs> like I kind of ruined myself for corporate America. So uh, um, sure. I, I ended up sort of just, I don't know, drifting back isn't the, quite the right word, but I sort of came, came back to independent filmmaking. Um, and uh, yeah, so I sort of suddenly sort of woke up one day and I produced 20 something films and half a dozen of them had been queer. And, you know, I sort of like, when did that happen? Um, so it was, um, I, I mean, you know, um, 
that's how I got here. I, in terms of making my first queer film, was I, I, I ran into Alan Brocker at uh, Slam Dance, I think it was, um, and then met him again. At, he had uh, Rick and Steve, the happiest gay couple in all the world, which was first mm -hmm. that short, and then the following year it played as part of Spike and Mike, which was part of Slam Dance that year. Uh, and uh, then I met him in an elevator on the way up to an outfest party uh, here in LA. Um, and it was like we had to work together. We both sort of started looking for stuff, and then and then five years later, um, um, he came came to with. The, he, I mean, he pitched me a couple of things which I always thought was sort of difficult and uncommercial and hard to make. And then he came to me with boy culture, um, and I was like, if I'm going to make a queer film, it's got to be something, you know, different and meaningful. And I'd read the book, and I loved the book, and. Um, that sort of launched me on that particular part of the tra tra trajectory. Um, mm. Yeah, that, that's great. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in the experience of a couple of you coming off of like a real breakout. Uh, how how that perhaps informs the way you look at what you want to do after that. Like Jeffrey, in your case, the sheer success of Final Destination, I'm sure it, it it opens up something in terms of like questions of what do I want to do next? How do I want to be in this in this industry, be a leader in this industry? So how did how did you experience that post moment? It was interesting. I always feel like Debbie Downer because um, I lived in New York when the first Final Destination came out, and since I'd lived worked at New Line since I was pretty much nineteen, I was kind of like, oh, this is cool. I'll just stay at New Line, and, and I came up with the story for the sequel. Um, so I I didn't think to move to LA and really kind of take advantage of the surprise success of Final Destination. I was just like, oh, I'll just, I'll write another one. And then finally they were like, we love you, Jeffrey, but now you're, you're a big boy now, go out in the world. Uh, so by the time I moved to LA, um, I had sold the movie in 97. Um, so it was kind of like re kind of connecting myself with the town. Like yeah. um, I just, I, I'd always had this, even though I worked at the studio on the corporate side, I had this kind of, again, fantasy about how, you know, the movie does well and all of a sudden everybody just comes chasing you down to, to see what you have next. And, um, you know, so there was a little bit of identity crisis when, the, when people weren't like chasing me down. Um, and then I, when I did the second final destination, I moved to, to LA and it was, it was really more like, you know, I want to be, I wanted to obviously still work in the the industry, and I and I wanted to create more gay, you know, content. But also, I'm a huge horror fan, so I was trying to merge those two together, mm -hmm. which um, is more accepted now. It's it, again another difficult thing is you just try to you try to smash these things together where you know the obvious fan base isn't going to be as receptive to it. So um, it was you know it's it was always it's always a struggle like when you because I, I never want, I try not to worry too much about being commercial, but when something like Final Destination just comes out and it's such a zeitgeist thing that you yeah. just don't expect, like you you try to chase that dragon for a time, you're like, well, I've got to come up with something this big and commercial and successful so that then I can go on and make my indie stuff that I want to make. Uh, and so then it becomes also a, a thing that kind of fills you with doubt. So you have to really work Work through that as leadership, <laughs> leadership point, but kind of you know getting over the, the yourself, um, and trying to get back to your voice, you know your truth. Because final session was something that came out of a story that I wanted to tell and was something's a success. A lot of times you start putting that pressure on yourself, like, well, I have to do another thing that's successful, um, and that can hold you back. Yeah. One other element uh, to what you're speaking to here is, you know, when I was growing up, queer content was its own small niche, and it wasn't really pushing into other genres, as you were saying you wanted to do. Um, so in terms of just wanting to tell our own stories, your own stories, uh, Nicole say, what was that kind of experience like of, especially as a filmmaker, uh, as well as a producer, um, finding yourself maybe marginalized just by the fact of who you were and what stories you wanted to tell. Uh, well, absolutely. It's, it's been, you know, like what we've all been talking about, a, um, 
a massive evolution since the 90s, 80s, 90s. Um, but it's also um, come at a, a, a price for us, I feel, because mm -hmm. I used to open the Castro and the, or, or do the Friday Night Castro and Outfest DGA and all of that. I can't get arrested at those festivals because I'm not from a studio. You know, mm -hmm. we helped make the festivals and now we don't count. So it's very, very difficult from, from that standpoint. Um, and because the, the, we have so flawlessly had our 15 moments of, minutes of fame last almost 30 years. We're in every sitcom and every drama and every you name it token, this, that, and the other thing. And some of them are done really well and some of them are just tokenism. And so it's sort of like, I feel like we got swallowed up and um, it's once again, trying to reinvent yourself inside that um, sort of situation. And I wrote, you know, the, the art versus commerce um, struggle that we all have. I don't really have it. I just need to find money to make my movies <laughs> because I've never been commercial um, and, you know, probably at my expense, but I've at least been able to always have final cut. I edit my own films. Nobody tells me what to do. And um, that's, that's great freedom. Hmm. So. Steven, in your case, you've you've made um, films on, on, a, on a range of scales. So I'm curious what your perspective is on, on this topic and the, the question of um, making, as you were saying, half a dozen queer films just suddenly <laughs> on your on your filmography. But you know what that actually practically looked like. Well, I, I mean, as Nicole said earlier, it, like every film is a battle, and getting every film made is. Is is a victory uh, and getting once you've made that it's like getting it into a festival is a victory and once you've made that getting it distributed is a victory and then then how did you do and like did you actually get a theatrical that's a victory and uh, you know so every step is is a battle um, I sort of kind of bifurcated my career a little bit in the sense that I try and make one kind of more commercial movie that that I get paid for um, <laughs> um, each year. And at the same time, try and do another LGBT movie that is, you know, the budgets are, you know, sort of like, I mean, I, I can't take a fee on those. So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm not making money on those. And then, so I'm making money on the commercial stuff to, to, to fund where I guess my heart's really at. Um, and, and then every now and again, you get a swan song, um, which sort of does both. Um, but, you know, the truth is those are the minority. Um, you know, it's it's sort of like when we did GBF, I mean, the responses to that film, the reviews on that film were incredible. Um, mm -hmm. And yet we couldn't get, you know, a big distributor behind it. We got Vertical behind it, who did a great job, but they, you know, they couldn't push it outside the sort of gay box, even though the reviews of teenagers in a teen comedy were you know phenomenal and we became the most pirated movie on the web um mm -hmm. which was yay you know <laughs> <laughs> but um uh, but you know when that's not translating to the kind of financial success that honestly the, the the critical and audience reception of the film warranted that's that that that's a little bit destroying um but uh, and 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 I I I I know Nicole, you in particular have kind of dealt with that particular phenomenon of the the the, the piracy stuff. Oh my gosh! <laughs> um, but but you know, but my my UK distributor was was just sort of like, look, we can't stop the 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 piracy. We just have to try and like work with it and make it work for us. Um, and and so using the piracy, if you will, to get the word out on the on on the film itself, and hopefully. You know, we get some trickle down, yay Reagan. Um, but uh, so, so for me, it's you know, while I do try and incorporate, you know, inclusivity in into the the more mainstream films that I'm doing, um, you know, there there is a clear difference between the LGBT yep. stuff and the commercial stuff, and um, so I have a lot more creative freedom with the LGBT stuff. And it, you know, it's, 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 as I say, it's where my heart is. Um, but I'm, you know, I, I, I mean, I could not afford this house on the LGBT films. I'm, <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, I want to address the um, piracy issue because there's another issue we have that's, you know, like um, blind piracy. It's a youth oriented, we get everything free. Now, I always say to people when they say, well, why can't I just have your films for free? Or why do I have to pay for anything? Why can't I just go see it on Netflix? It's like, um, if you continue to uh, cut away any of the profits that a filmmaker can make, you just completely stop surviving. Um, and they don't understand because they come from that free culture. I always say to them, it's like if you were a furniture maker and, and somebody spent a year and a half making this beautiful armoire, would you come by and think you could just take it for free? I mean, they don't understand that what we have is basically, even though it's invisible, it's our IP and it's the only value that we have. So it's it's one of those things that we're trying to figure out, how do you deal with this generation who pirates just from the virtue of that they feel like everything should be free? <laughs> um, so mm -hmm. that's another issue we deal with. Yeah, I, I think this question of accessibility is very interesting in 2023 when you know you're talking about fighting to get into a festival nowadays there is a certain consumer expectation that everything you make is just going to be there for them to watch it wherever they subscribe but but also by the same token there's the rest of the world um yep. where lgbt stuff is just not available yeah no. that's true and, and and you know if we could make our film look you know if if, if gbf had been available for a buck around the world yeah that would have been literally millions of dollars okay from 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 you know if, if we've been able to get one dollar from everyone and i think audiences are willing to pay you know reasonable prices for 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 product i mean there's no question that there's a sort of piracy culture but in in the like in the vast majority of the rest of the world it's just not available and piracy is their only option um and and so i don't we you know, I'm I'm a filmmaker, not a distributor, and uh, or an exhibitor. So it's it's a little hard to sort of figure out how to crack that. Not exactly, but but the availability issue is. I mean, how are you going to make a film available for free, but or for for a fee in Saudi Arabia? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's um, it's a bit of a philosophical question, I guess. But it's 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 it's, it's something I always think about in the piracy part of it. it it's piracy makes things accessible in places in the world where where lgbt is just not available hmm. so. so i'm curious now um you know all of you coming from these really varied and and uh, complicated uh, experiences what what is the balance for you between telling really authentic stories which i'm sure is the aim and and inclusive and and stories that reflect who you are with getting it made and um meeting this climate, this kind of strange moment in our industry where it's at. Uh, Jeffrey, why don't I go to you on that one? Yeah, no, I, you know, that's something that I'm still, for myself personally, I'm kind of sorting out because I want to tell, you know, LGBTQ stories. I want to tell stories about people of color. I want to tell, you know, I'm from Kentucky, from poor Appalachia. I want to tell stories about that region, which is so misunderstood. There's just so much that I want to do. Um, that you know i'm trying to again sort out like the best kind of plan like that's why i'm glad i'm, I'm actually visiting a clear my head because that's become a more important now that i've gotten a little older in the past it was kind of like i need that one more for you know i can't just have final destination on my grade but i'm like fuck me that's like, like which, um, but you yeah, so I get a for that, but now I'm, you know, as again, I'm seeing what's going on in the world, you know, I start thinking about how, again, as a kid, I didn't have any buddy to, to look up to for certain stories. I didn't see myself in any, any kind of shows. And so I'm like, I've got, I, I need to do that now. Um, and I just have to figure out how, like, that's, I think that's probably the eternal question is, you know, mm -hmm. figuring out that story or that this, the way to kind of tap into the three intersecting you know racial you know sexual orientation and the poverty kind of trifecta that's i feel needs to just be addressed somehow mm. speaking of um leadership uh, which is why we're all here today 
as you've started to try to figure this out, have you gotten any particularly good pieces of advice on, on you know, embarking on that journey? People tell me to write what, what I want to write, not worry about commercial, which I've already kind of put that out of my head. But they're like, you know, because I'm feeling so much, I'm not an angry person. I grew up, you know, very kind of a mediator, you know, <laughs> as far as, as problem solutions and, and problem solving. Um, but I found myself very angry right now. And so people are, people tell me to tap into that anger because I, I, I'm not, I haven't. But I don't know if I want to write an angry movie. Like I, I, I maybe I want to write a hopeful movie. Like that's, so that's what the, you know, the advice I'm getting is follow your heart, but then, you know, my heart's full of anger right now. Um, so I don't, it might be a good way to purge, but again, if, if it, I'm mindful of that, if this is a story I'm putting out that's representing a community, I want it to speak to them in maybe a positive, empowering way, because I feel like the world is kind of sucking that away from us right now. I'm having a midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> right this, here. Is, this is therapy, right? right that's here, why right we're now. here. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're here. Uh, that's slightly easier just because 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 of my role as a producer not as a, if you will a, a frontline creative in the sense that mm -hmm. i get to choose that choose the products projects uh I, I mean but but to some extent they just choose me really you know um uh, you know i i i i wasn't thinking about kind of the 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 um older gay experience i say this is a slightly older gay man but um but but you know when 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 Udo came to me with Swan Song I was just sort of like wow that is a part of the experience that hasn't really mm. been uh addressed well um and you know so I mean my next film is is you know a, a, a trans movie but again it came to me as a story that I thought this is a story that that, that I want to want to get behind so I'm a, a little luckier in that respect in the in the you know I can well, as I say, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether I'm choosing the projects or the projects are choosing me. But um. <laughs> hmm. Swan Song, a uh, film I love, by the way, is is a great example uh, of yeah. On the one hand, you have an actor coming to you. It's it's an untold story, even within our community. Um, but it, do you find that it also reflects any advances in in what people are willing to make financing, how it's willing to come together uh, for a, diff a range of, of LGBTQ movies. Mm, sorry, no, not really. I, 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 Good I answer. <laughs> That's why I'm asking. <laughs> I, I, I really don't think the financing picture has got particularly better. Yeah. Um, the number of LGBT theme stories that the, the mainstream studios and so forth get behind are still pitifully few. Mm -hmm. um, and their choices are often pitiful um, and uh, are rehashing stuff that we as filmmakers have covered decades ago. Um, and so um, is more gay stuff getting getting made? Yes, I guess it is, but it, I, I'm sorry, I'm not finding it any, any easier than I did 15 years ago. And, um, uh, and, and you know, there was a sort of brief flash of light in two thousand, late two thousands, before the DVD market fell apart, um, where we were able to get a little bit more of an MG out of the films and so forth. So for a moment there, it looked good, but you know, when the DVD market fell away, so did the primary source of LGBT films revenue, um, and we, you know, we thought that um, streaming would step in to fill the gap, and 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 and. and it has to some extent, but it, it but not really. Um, it is the one thing I can say is that LGBT T films will get distributions. Uh, so so that that's a big thing. Mm -hmm. and the other thing is, please continue to support the queer film festivals because they play such a vital role in us being able to reach an audience. Um, and, 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 and frankly, provide the supplemental revenue stream that, that keeps some films afloat. Um, so, you know, it, it, I, I mean, the, the revenue stream that's available to kind of decent queer films is, is pathetic. Um, and, you know, even when I have a film, you know, like Swan Song that got picked up by Magnolia, you know, that got two Independent Spirit nominations, yada, 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 the list of successes is, is crazy, but the numbers are still a fraction mm -hmm. of, of, you know what I'm getting for 
you know, I'm sorry, a couple of the thrillers I've made are not particularly good, but they get a, make a lot more money. Mm-hmm. We sorry. have another issue. I'm allowed to say that. Sorry. <laughs> We're live. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, please. Uh, I wanted to, you know, there's another issue, which is, um, to me, the thing that's l- destroying us yet further on the internet streaming. My last feature was streamed over 8 million times on this platform. I don't make a cent because, you know, they call it stacking pennies. Well, that's great if you're, you know, uh, Marvel, but if you're, you know, an independent micro independent independent filmmaker, it's completely meaningless. Even if they charged 59 cents for that movie 8 million times, I would be whole, you know? But it's like that ad rev stream is beyond, you know, it's sort of like the last, you know, uh, (laughs) like boon on us. Um, And uh, when we get, get around to our current projects, I'm basically trying a distribution strategy that's the antidote to that. Um, but I don't know if it'll work. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, uh, I did, Nicole, want to also throw that that earlier question to you about this, the balance now between what the market is, what the reality is for what you can make and, and what you want to make. How have you found that currently? I have been extremely blessed that I've been able to crowdfund my films based on the, I've had a very rabid fan base from Claire of the Moon. It's in its 30th year of distribution. It's still the gift that keeps on giving. It's sort of like, you know, uh, it's just a wonderful thing from that. It's the worst film I've made, but it is is Mm -hmm. what it is. It's old clunky film making. It was my first film. But from that point forward, I've been able to either have executive producers who bring in the entire amount or um, as was the case for Little Man. Um, and uh, uh, and all the rest of the features have been crowdfunded or heavily donored or uh, what I call, they're the patron saints of lesbian film. Um, I have a woman who funded the entire uh, film uh, show coming out for love, which is 16 hour long episodes. So it's a lot of money she put into this for the yeah. community. So I've been very, very blessed. Uh, it's so hard though. You can't just go raise money. I mean, truly. And I never even tell people you're ever going to make a return because you're not. Um, that's why most of the money is donored. So mm. I've just been blessed. Speaking of um, what you're telling people, these are pretty significant challenges uh, for for all of you to navigate, for everybody to navigate. So what, as you've been in this industry for a number of years now, are you in turn telling people? How are you thinking about leadership? How are you thinking about mentorship and just what it means to sort of help others uh, navigate this this time? Uh, Jeffrey, we'll start with you. Yeah. Um... I do try to mentor people as often as I can and also speak whenever I can, because I feel like that's important. Um, and I did, yeah, all, the only advice I can really give them is through my lens of what I've experienced. But I tell them, you know, this is obviously, I think, a business that if you want to be in, you have to be willing to c- commit your life to it. <laughs> um, I still meet too many people that that come to L.A. or hit me up and they're like, yeah, I'm going to try this writing thing or this acting thing or this producing thing for a year and see if it works. And it's like that you're, you're just cluttering up the, you know, the world for the people that, that are passionately wanting to do this. Um, you know, I, I tell them not to take personal, you know, work criticism as a reflection on their, their self-worth. Like that's, I, you know, that, that can be a very crushing thing, you know, still bad reviews, still get under my skin, you know, somewhat, but you know, they would have devastated me when I was younger. Um, um, and I think it's about surrounding yourself with like a great support network. Um, you know, I often find that writers hang out with only writers and directors hang out with directors. It's like, hey, maybe my guys might want to get together, you guys and gals. It's stuff, it's your stuff. Um, so, and and it's just, again, it may sound a little Oprah-y, but I'm just like, just treat, treat everybody well. Um, and it's not even just because someday they might be in a position to help you. It's just like, it is it is a, it's such a small world, especially when you work in an industry, even the film world. Like I, this set, I, there are three people that worked on other projects of mine that I'd ever met. But you know, it's like, it's such a, we're such a connected world. It's just like treat people well, treat them with respect, try to lift them up when you can. 
And, you know, obviously you have to watch out for toxic people as well. That's a, that's a bad side of just the world. You have to worry about toxic people and keep the, those people out of your lives. Um, and uh, just st stay in gratitude. I know I, <laughs> I, I probably sounded like a, a little, little like grumpy today, but, but I, I actually am very, very, very grateful because I've been able to survive for mm -hmm. 30 some years um, as a kid thinking I wanted to be a part of. So I just stay in gratitude a lot. And Nicole, what about for you? Well, gratitude, the same thing. That's my religion. Um, I love mentoring filmmakers, screenwriters, even novelists. I had a Claire of the Moon scholarship for second time novelists for years and um, love to teach anybody that wants to be taught, you know, or what they want to uh, know about the business that I can try to share with them sort of my 12 stepping in the film world so yeah the same the same thing and staying always in gratitude like I said I'm extremely blessed and I get to do what I love that I'm passionate about every single day so um super grateful and, and Stephen how about for you um look I think the most rational piece of advice you can give to anybody uh, uh, coming into the business is go do something else but 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 the point is none of us who stuck with it are doing a, a, a particularly rational people um and you you have to have that uh if you will sense of exceptionalism uh, in in order to be in this business um and and the, and the other thing is you know this is honestly why the industry has for so long favored like uh, rich white guys okay because at the end of the day most of us come like I came from corporate America. I had a war chest when I started. Um, mm -hmm. And as I told people, I didn't have F you money, but I did have damn you money. Um, <laughs> so, but the point is, it gave me the stamina to survive those first, you know, five, six years. I mean, it took me forever to make my second film. Um, and, um, and, 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 and that's an unfortunate truth. And, and that's the baseline reason, I think why the industry has 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 you know favored white guys and white male voices um be, because we come with with better resources and that's an act I, I don't want to say the accident of birth but that's that's white privilege right there mm -hmm. and um but yes you have to be a little irrational to <laughs> to, to e e even if you come in with resources you have to be a little irrational and that I think is what makes us kind of love each other a little bit because we're all a little crazy. So. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, to, to your point about the, the rich white guys of it all, um, I, how have you found responding to cultural shifts and particularly within this community? Um, you know, it, it was not that long ago, for example, that it was quote unquote acceptable for a cis actor to play a trans role. You know, these things have pretty rapidly shifted, at least within the industry. Um, how has that impacted the work uh, each of you do? Stephen, I'll, I'll stick with you to start. Well, I, I'm, as, um, first of all, I have to find myself checking myself a little bit um, because, you know, there, you, you know, the world that you, you know the world that I came into. Uh, I don't know. Weird. Like, hmm. okay, I'm a Jewish kid from London. Okay, my grandfather escaped from Germany. Okay, with nothing. Okay, a generation on, when my father put me in for like one of England's top elite schools, I was rejected because I was Jewish. Okay, so that's how I grew grew, grew up. Okay, and then you know, sort of, I didn't come out until later. But, you know, my formative years in kind of corporate were the suggestion that you were gay would get you fired. Okay, the, you, you know, there were absolutely no worker protections. Okay, and things moved at lightning speed, where from, I, I don't know what the, the exact years were, but when I graduated from business school, that was the world we were in. It's like gay was, you know, gays were dying and gays could be fired. Okay, and maybe 10 years later, Booz Allen and Hamilton, the company I worked for, is regarded as one of the great places to work if you're a gay. The Ivy League business schools all have gay student associations, which would have been an unheard of thing. So things moved so fast 
Okay, and I find myself sometimes sort of hold. Wait, let me catch up. <laughs> um, and um, so, so, so sometimes I find that I have to, you know, Outfest as a gay white man was a safe space. Okay, and sometimes because of the demand, the real needed demand for additional inclusivity that includes um, you know, women and people of color and trans folks, sometimes that safe space feels a little less safe. Um, and, and, and we have to check ourselves a little bit about that because it can, it can be, you know, we all wanted the world to be in meritocracy to begin with. But then, you know, as a, I was an assistant programmer at Outfest for a few years, and then I ran the Screenwriters Lab for a bunch of years. And we have to balance the 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 product. We have we have to product. Who hate that word? The content. Um, we, like like when you find, um, it, it would be very easy for the Outfest Screenwriters Lab to end up with, you know, five white guys every year. Okay, yeah. we can't. You, you, we we have to be more inclusive than that, and that means that you have to say no to some really really talented folks, okay? And it's a painful price, um, but it's 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 a necessary one. Does that that answer the question, kind of thing? Yeah, it's beautiful. I'm wondering, Jeffrey or Nicole, if you want to jump in on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think for for me, and I'm, I'm just going to use the casting world because I think it's a much easier reference for people to get because um I think when you're when you're it used to be straight white men were the kind of default for and straight white women were the default for every role um especially if it was a leading role in a film so you know I know this from 10 years of the studio it's like we would you know we would ask for you know open to all ethnicities and we'd still get all white people to come in because that was just the default um, so the implication has always been, they would always say, well, we found, we would just found the best actor or actors for the part. It's like, well, you only looked at a certain pool. You didn't look at this pool of all these other ethnicities. And the thing is, there are amazing, you know, um, of all genders and all sexual orientations, and they've never been looked at before. They, they just were looked over, like, it's because, and also because they didn't, sell, it didn't sell overseas internationally. People mm -hmm. of color didn't sell overseas. So that's the reality that's been behind the business model for so long. So the way I look at it now is we're actually starting to look at the other pools that have been training and working as hard and as are and talented and as everybody in the other pools, they've just never been looked at before because of, of because they were women, because they were, you know, LGBTQ or they were, you know, a person of color. Um, because it be, and I the pushback that I see now a lot of times is like oh well more talented white people are not getting work you know straight white people are not getting work because they're giving the stuff to other people and it's like no there's again there are that should not be the case and if that is the case then it's ridiculous but and everything that I've been involved with in the industry it's like no they're actually they've started looking because I've had many roles in the past where the best person was a, a gay actor or a, a, a a woman of color and they're like she's by far the best actress but we can't sell her overseas so we're going to go with a white woman mm -hmm. so it's not it's not, not it's so that's we're not in a world now where all this you know untalented people of that you know are being pulled from like the shadows and, and and being given stuff it's like they're the people that have went to you know i went to school with a lot of you know queer students and people of color like they're the same age as me. They work just as hard as me. I have obviously privilege because I'm lighter skinned than, you know, my darker brothers and sisters out there, what they have to face. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a needed course correction. It's coming as shell shock to a lot of people. And so I think there's a pretty harsh backlash, mm -hmm. um, but it'll, it'll, you know, we'll ride it out. And, and again, it's, you know, seismic change does shake things up and, make, and, and makes us all uncomfortable. I went to see and then I'll hush, but I, when I went to see the first Spider-Man movie with Tom Holland, that movie was so diverse, like even in the background, because it's set in New York as it, you know, it looks, but it was so like, I saw a Sikh in the background and, the, and it actually made me uncomfortable for a second because I wasn't used to seeing it on screen. And I'm like, yeah, that shows you how ingra ingrained this kind of 
you know, prejudice of, of against all the things, you know, not just be, being queer or being of color, but even of men and women. And it's it's so ingrained in our system that I, I, I was like, oh, this is so weird. And then I was like, what the fuck am I saying? Like, this is like how it should be. Mm. Can, can, I, can I qualify that for one second? Because mm. I completely agree with you, but, but, but there is one part of that, that that doesn't come through in the conversation. So many movies, particularly in the genre end of the world, are financed through foreign pre-sales. Yeah. Okay. And so when it comes to foreign pre-sales, you are stuck with what the buyers say. Right. Okay. okay. And if the buyers say, and I've heard it endlessly, I'm sorry to say that, you know, particularly black folks in the leads won't sell overseas. Yeah. Now, that doesn't make the producers bias. That makes us a victim of, 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 of bias. Um, yeah. um, the studios, on the other hand, never have that excuse. Um, yeah. because, because the studios are not uh, uh, subject to a pre-sale model. Um, so I, I just wanted to sort of qualify that. Yeah. And I should point out too, yeah, and I, and I and I didn't mean that there was the the bias was from the producers. I mean, the the answer from the studios is always like we picked the best person for the role. Mm -hmm. um, when there there wasn't, you know, like like you said, the foreign buyers are going, especially black people don't have value. The funny thing is, I just talked to a producer this last week and who now said that since everything's going to streaming in America, now all of a sudden they're open now to, to more black people in leads because they're going to be making most of their money on selling it back to streaming to America. So it's funny how, you know, again, that, that business thing that nobody knows about in most of the world that, that watches movies, that foreign idea that, you know, well, we can't have black people in the leads, you know, because that does fall back onto, like you said, the independent films, especially where you get half your, your money from foreign, you know, MGs and pre-sales. Um, that just puts puts you in a bad position, but then yeah, the studio would never just be honest about that and say, "Well, we have to," you know, because they they still do that. They used to worry about that a little bit, even at well, New Line was didn't worry about that. But <laughs> um, um, and and let, let's also go back to like when we were casting Boy Culture, which was uh, two thousand six, I think. Um, we couldn't get gay people to take the role. Mm. Okay, because 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 gay actors were afraid of being typecast as gay, um, and, and that I'm sure we've all dealt with that in in in, in casting queer roles. Um, I mean, obviously not as much now as, as 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 then, but you know, you know, there's still closeted uh, uh, you know big name actors who won't come out. Um, how do you classify where you're casting them? <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> uh, I did want to mention uh, that we're going to take a few audience questions a little bit later. Uh, so if you have any for our wonderful panelists, you can go in the chat, make sure they're the hosts and panelists, and uh, we'll be sure to get to them. Um, I did want to go a little bit further out and ask um, about what we were talking about at the beginning a little bit, which is broader political climate, what we're seeing uh, in terms of legislation uh, that's been really disturbing, I think, I'm sure for everyone. Uh, speaking on this panel and listening, um, how does how do these shifts and these these developments motivate you uh, as leaders and producers? How do they challenge you? Um, and yeah, how have you how has that impacted your work? Um, Nicole, why don't we start with you? Well, one of the things, um, and I agree with Jeffrey about the casting um, because I don't you know do pre sales and I'm able to cast pretty much the right person for the right role, but um, I've been able to have um, uh, Nakar Zadigan, who is from Persia, and I have Jessica Clark, who's from Nigeria. She's actually the host of Coming Out for Love. And when I, you know, we did a perfect ending, which she was one of the leads in, um, in 2012. And those films, uh, Elena and Donna, Perfect Ending, they're all on Netflix, which is awesome. Um, and because it is, you know, ubiquitous and it helps promote your 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 films always and um, they get relicensed all the time. So I'm very excited about that. But when I cast uh, Jessica as the host for Coming Out for Love, 
Uh, she said, if we do this, we're doing it completely diverse. And I said, I'm with you a thousand percent. And in our second episode, we have this huge issue that arises from two women who knew each other on social media, a white woman who used the N word and Amber, our lead, our first key master, as we call her is, um, black and, and Mexican. So it's, it was a huge, uh, dialogue that we were able to open up to our very, very diverse cast, um, with the Asian community talking about the colorism, the Latina community talking about their colorism and the constant need to be lighter and lighter and lighter. Um, so we've been able to really, uh, hit some heavy duty issues that are of this time, the zeitgeist at this point in time. Um, and so we're very, very proud of that. And that's one of the things that, you know, we made a decision that we will always show our community in its beautiful rainbow colors. So yeah, that's, it's, it, that falls on us at this point. Great. Uh, anyone else want to speak to the question of, you know, current legislation and, and how it's impacting your work? I, I think the one thing that we have to be wary of is that we can't let um, I don't want to sound hyper uh, I don't want to say this say this carefully. Um, we have had political correctness as being the enemy of honest discussion within our community. okay? And we cannot let the current war on woke. Um, allow us to censor ourselves in having honest discussions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when I go back to talking about leadership and doing things that are difficult, that's one of the things that, that I mean is political correctness is self-censorship and it's our enemy. Mm -hmm. and, and while I don't want to give any ammunition or credence to the BS that's coming out of DeSantis's mouth, we do have to uh, watch ourselves. Hmm. Um, Nicole, you were nodding along a little there. Well, I think it's because I've gone through, you know, <laughs> four and a half decades of the community going from dyke to lesbian, queer, blah, blah, blah. And now we have so many letters in our alphabet soup, it's hard to know, you know, who's what and where. The slivering we're doing within our community is wonderful because each of those slivers then gets some light, but it also, also then segregates us all further. And so I, I have kind of an issue. I wish we could all just be called one word, literally. And I know that doesn't capture everybody's unique, authentic self. Um, I wish that word could just be fluid. We're all just fluid. And, you know, um, I, I feel like if, if we were all just fluid, 100% of us, we wouldn't have the same issues. So uh, that's sort of my my take on it. I was totally schooled during shooting uh, coming out for love. All the all the contestants, the 16 contestants, were between you know 24 and 32, and the way they communicate with each other, the way they have all of this incredible political correctness with each other and consent and all this stuff is so completely foreign to an old dyke like me from the 90s, you know, it's like, what? So um, it, it's sort of hard for me to, you know, since it changes every four or five years to get all, you know, seriously worked up about it beyond that, um, you know, because we're constantly doing this in our community. I don't know why I think it, I, I think it uh, sometimes deserves us, so. I, I do too, and I, too, to, to, to Stephen's point, I think that, you know, we have, we, ha we have people out there who don't want us to exist. Mm -hmm. And they are looking for any excuse, whether it's critical race theory to like pull us back to like pre-civil rights movement to like this new war on woke, which was a stupid thing because obviously it's just, they, they don't even know what woke means. It's just like, oh, we know it when we see it. So, but there, that you know they're they're using anything they can against us so i think that sometimes we have to pick our battles and i think we're all we're human that's i think a good word to describe everybody human um we can all agree on and i think that 
if we start trying to like parse things and this doesn't come from like organically this is like some pr professor somewhere says there's no such thing as gender and all of a sudden we have this new war going on that's covering like you know that pulls us into this and it's like people can identify but yeah when i was younger it was like tomboys were girls that were you know would we would consider non-binary now because they don't act like girls and sissies were boy it's like we gotta not get so wrapped up in this war of, of words in my opinion when there's again the people they they want to wipe us out they don't want they want us all back in the closet they want to convert us they want us to go back to africa they you know they don't want us to exist and there's a part of there's a part of humanity where change feels uncomfortable you know and, and awkward and if the people that want us gone are able to channel that in everybody that's not part of our community mm -hmm. you know they're gonna they're gonna you know set us back a long way so i think we just have to gird ourselves for 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 battle and again and see what's really what's really important like we we everybody is i always tell everybody you're you're already unique and special like there's only one you in this fucking world so we don't need a word for every single person that's different that because we i can't keep track of my friends you know i forget my friends names so i try to be respectful of how people want to be identified but you know there's also a level of respect of like somebody that you don't know or you're only going to meet once like i've been yelled at for misidentifying somebody that i've only met one time in my life i'm like fuck you I, mean, I don't even remember your name like um, you know not to be rude but it's like you know i you know if you're a friend of mine that's fine but you know again where i think some of these like battles that were these cultural battles that were you know the right knows what they're doing like some congress person like five or six years ago said that critical race theory was going to be like a winning issue and then all of a sudden you see it turn into like they create it and then they blame us for it and same thing with this woke stuff my you know i have straight friends going well you gays are doing this and you know you want to you know mutilate children so i'm like what the fuck are you talking about <laughs> well that's the other it. thing you know roe v wade being overturned and all of the insanity of that it's like <sighs> We, we, we are, we're going, I feel like Handmaid's Tale is so realistic now. It's, it's beyond, um, it's terrifying for all of us, every one of us, you know, so we, that is something we need to take care of. And so does the DOJ, right? Well, the, ir the irony is, is that the public is generally speaking with us on these issues. Um, and, and that's what is so dispiriting about the current political climate. Is a, it, it's, as I say, dispiriting. So let's be nice to each other in the meantime. Yes. <laughs> a lovely note uh, to shift on. <laughs> Uh, after after a sobering conversation. Uh, well, thank you all for sending in some questions and the kind comments. Uh, we can start from the top. Um, the first one, uh, Nicole, you were talking about a new uh, distribution stream you were trying. Uh, Corey was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. So basically, um, when we did Coming Out for Love, one of the things that we decided we were going to try, especially since I was so distraught over the over 8 million views of my last film that means absolutely nothing to me financially, um, that I was like, okay, what's the antidote to this particular crisis we're in right now? And I decided to create what I call the rainbow playground so that everybody who wants to be involved in this show can be involved on a financial level at no expense to themselves. What we've done is with between our 16 contestants and we have 19 guest judges with everybody from Sedona Prince to Carolyn Giuliani to Franco Stevens of Curve Magazine. We have all of these what I call legacy lesbians who grew up with me uh, either in magazines or photography like Judy Francesconi and all of all of those people, as well as all of these amazing um, lead diverse uh, jud guest judges and hosts we have like Stoney Michelle Love from Stuzo Clothing, which is a gender-free apparel line. You know, one of the things that's exciting about this show is you get to see the, all the incredible um, fabulousness of our community through the guest judges and the uh, contestants. So basically they all get a coupon. It's usually their name and capitals. They get 10% off to their whoever's in their list and people, and they make 25% on every, every bit they, they sell. And they can either sell the bundles, which are in four 
different ways. You get different value levels where you get to see the whole 16 series episode series that way, or you can rent them episode by episode. And whatever the coupon code is, you make that money. And we're doing that also with nonprofits who we're putting the coupon code in their name so that, that it can go to that nonprofit. So what I basically said to everybody, you come and you bring your list and you make money off of them. No expense. We have this big, huge Google Drive full of promotional materials for TikTok and Insta. Every single week, every single week, a new episode drops. So that's basically um, the experiment I'm trying to get, give everybody a share in the show's success or lack of success and um, figure out how to use this model to help other filmmakers like Steven. Where can people see stuff internationally? You could set up a thing on the Coming Out for Love sp screening platform because we pay for a platform that you can get to from anywhere in the world. And we did that specifically because this show is so important for the communities that we were talking about in the outside world. We're already dealing with um, Brazil for a second episode, and we're trying to do the Tyra model, a Coming Out for Love for every single country, as well as every single letter in our alphabet. I'm looking for gay male producers to sub-license to, trans, bi, we're going to do it all. And that's one of the things that we are trying to promote as, you know, the most realistic, authentic um, way to, to represent our community within a reality television show. But we have a saying, it's like reality TV cut like a feature, because it is, because I'm cutting it. So <laughs> it's... Um, uh, doing really well with the mainstream community because they've never seen us like this before. Uh, I'll do one last little story and then shut up. Uh, uh, I had a hard bitten publicist in the community for 25 years. I knew her really well. And she, after she saw the ec second episode, which is the racism episode, she said she was bawling. And she said, it's so amazing because these, gr these are girls, but they talk like scholars and they really do. I feel like everybody who sees the show is going to want to take a lesbian home. <laughs> and I feel like every <laughs> gay man who watches the show is going to want to be Jessica Clark because she's fabulous. She has all these wonderful outfits and she's just wickedly funny on top of it all. So um, that's my antidote to stream, to add rev share. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Nicole. Um, our next question is from Alex, uh, who asks, uh, if you feel the same topic is being portrayed over and over again, uh, using the example of, say, a lot of coming out stories. And, and if so, why why we tend to hit the same story beats when there's a lot more to our journeys and stories? Uh, why don't I throw that to Jeffrey? I mean, I I certainly can't speak to f filmmakers, I but I do feel like a lot of times these films come from filmmakers that are of a certain age. And I think we start looking back on our lives and start looking at the stories that maybe we wish we had had growing up. Um, I think that's why there's a, I, yeah, because even I, there was a certain point where I'm like, all right, I can't watch another coming out story. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, we, we, you also start thinking like, but I still meet people that, that are coming out or haven't come out to their families yet. I go to horror conventions uh, and kids will come over to me, our teenagers will come over to me and they'll, they'll be like, it's so cool that you're gay. Like I'm gay, but I can't, you know, and, and you realize like, a huge problem so we get to, I think as you know it, once you come out you get tired of coming out stories because you went through that and you don't want to necessarily have to relive it or your your experience wasn't as pleasant as the as the ones in the movies that they do make um but I think the only thing that we can do as individuals is really just tell whatever's important to us because I again it's not my job you know or it never should be my job to tell somebody another artist like what kind of films to make like they should make what is important to them. But I think that's why we do see a lot of coming out sort of especially as we were like, oh, this is like the story I wish would have happened to me, mm -hmm. you know, when I was young. Yeah. Stephen, I'm curious if you have any insight there in terms of, you know, what's easier to sell, stuff like that. I mean, I tend to agree that I'm kind of over coming out stories, but for most of us, coming out was probably the hardest thing we ever did. And mm -hmm. I, I and and I'm sure that's particularly true of our our our, our, our trans uh, uh, colleagues. Um, it must be hard as it was for me 
I can't imagine how hard it is for them. So the point is there's a lot of drama that is wrapped up in the coming out experience. And, and that's why the stories get told. Yeah, I mean, I would always rather make a movie that covers, you know, fresh ground and fresh tropics. And there are fresh ways to deal with the coming out story. But the, the truth is, <laughs> it is one of the most dramatic things we do in our lives. I mean, I, I, it, that, that, that is why there is, it, there is so much material there. Um, but yes, we, we, we should try and uh, expand the playing field. Uh, next question. With US streamers contracting, uh, are you interested in looking ahead to international co-productions? I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, another way of, of looking at that question is, you know, the the broadening of of avenues potentially to to get something done uh, as things here, in one respect, maybe contract. Oh, that kind of contracting. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Let's see. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, mean, I think it, we all can say yes uh, yeah. unanimously. <laughs> yeah, I think I, th yeah. I think I think we would. Uh, sorry, this is Rufus. Everyone, um, Rufus I, loves I, international co-productions. <laughs> uh, well, he's Hungarian, so you know, um, and that's where my next big feature is going to be. Hungary, there, Hungary. there you go. Uh, but um, yeah, yeah, I'll take money from anyone who gives it to me. Please, yes. <laughs> Resounding yes. Jeffrey, I assume you're on the same track. Oh yeah. I, I, <laughs> And then I was watching Rufus. Um. <laughs> <laughs> as we all were, as we all were. <laughs> yes. Uh, next question, um, looking back at that earlier topic of um, casting roles and, and whether or not, uh, you know, the, the box of queer roles, queer actors, et cetera, uh, this question brings up uh, an example of uh, a filmmaker wanting to cast a non-queer actor in a role, got some flack um for doing that is there a right way to to handle this kind of situation in today's climate and more broadly do you have any specific feelings on casting queer actors in queer roles at this point i think authenticity in casting is important but can be taken to extremes mm -hmm. a, a, a very dear friend of mine has just spent you know um uh you had two projects fall apart sequentially because he was trying to find the right exact mix of LGP and physical challenges to cast this this two roles in, in, in a row. And I won't say more than that. But the point is, it became so difficult to cast the roles, the projects fell apart. Mm -hmm. um, should we should... And if you're going to really be authentic in casting, then you ask the question is, oh dear, well, can gay people play straight roles? So, um, so I think the answer to that is it's complicated and it's, it's, there's not a glib one size fits all answer. Very complicated. It's further complicated in this way for me. I feel completely schizophrenic about this question because I've cast leads who are not lesbians and I love their performances yeah however and so I I feel like you know uh what Jeffrey was saying there is a pool of people from which you can cast that's in other communities is something that we all need to to pursue but oftentimes if you find that right person and they happen to be white you're going to cast them as an independent filmmaker because it's so important to you to get the right piece um however my last film was very much based on my son, who is the subject of Little Man, the documentary, because he was born 100 days too early at one pound and didn't know if he was going to live the first five years of his life. And um, when I went to go make More Beautiful for Having Been Broken, I was absolutely determined to find a child with special needs, you know, otherly abled. And I ended up looking out, getting the, the young actor that I got, Cal Farron, who has um, a very, very rare uh, genetic uh, issue that he was born with. And his performance is so stunning because it comes from this place of being cruelly taunted in school over and over until the point they have to pull him out of school, you know. 
he's a brilliant little actor and he finally got to fulfill himself by having you know basically sort of the male lead next to Bruce Davidson and French Stewart um he's magnificent he won a lot of best actor awards in the in the festival circuit I feel like otherly abled people should be cast by otherly abled actors I feel like that a million percent but I don't feel that way about the leads of my films so how mm -hmm. is that right you know yeah it's complicated but, Jeffrey, and as, I said, yeah. I, as I said when I did boy culture I went through a, 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 a list of gay actors who wouldn't take the role um yeah and, no yeah that's true too my and, I have a a Bollywood third generation Bollywood Indian actress who still can't come out you know what I'm saying she won't take the role that I wanted to give her because of that so it's like there's things that we're, we're, you know, it's the industry that we live in. And so. And, and my entire career is based on a, you know, a closeted gay actor who played a heterosexual monster in my first film. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I just, I want to add to that too, because it, it is a complicated thing because there's also, you know, it, and it's complicated for us too. Um, because then, then again, like, if you say, if you ideally like, yes, I want to cast a gay actor for a gay role because that way I don't have to listen to him in his interviews, talk about his girlfriend and you know how she thought he was so brave to take on the role of a guy who gets murdered in a slasher movie. Um, but there's there's also this knee jerk reaction because you're you're almost damned if you, there's we've gotten to a point. Again, where I think, like Stephen said earlier, we need to be kinder to each other within our community and then also with everybody else as well. But we've got to this point where people demand that, you know, they get furious if there's a movie, if there's a $60 million movie that's got a straight actor and a gay actor playing a couple, sorry, the straight actor got the $60 million. But, you know, like, would you rather that movie not come out? then have it made and if your answer is yeah that's that's fine but you're not a filmmaker so you know you know that's it's that's why it's it's a complicated thing like and um i think we wrestle with it but but yeah like i don't really i do care actually i shouldn't say i don't care but people just get so nasty these these days like when they announce a casting anything i mean you know they cast the first Black Mermaid. So happy for that. It's like so. Let's let's just enjoy. Like if we get a great gay story, like if we get a Brokeback Mountain made, that wouldn't have gotten made if it didn't have those two actors in it. Like let's be happy that we have a great movie that came out that opens a door for other gay movies that we can cast gay talent in. You know, is how I look at it. Yeah. Reference to Swan Song. There, there's a bit of a debate um, about whether Udo should come out. And Udo's like, what do you mean come out? It's like, <laughs> I, he's, been, <laughs> he, you know, he's, he's technically in the closet in Germany, I guess. But yeah. he was like, I'm not gonna issue a statement that says I'm gay because it would be, it would come across as ridiculously self-serving given the fact that he's lived his life as an out gay man for the last, you know, 30 years. Um, has he actually said the words like you know in a headline no but like but he was like I'm mm -hmm. I, you know it's like let me handle it my way I mean it was really funny in one of the Q&A's actually really telling the story just so I can tell the story um, <laughs> so, so, so we were at a QA and a and and somebody in the audience goes um, Udo are you gay and it's like why do you want to ask me out <laughs> I mean, his way of dealing with it was just so precious. But but the but the bigger point is that I, I think this boils down to it's complicated, um, and 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 we shouldn't have this one size fits all answer. Yeah, absolutely, no easy answers. Um, but on this panel, thank you all so so much for these um, incredibly complicated and and I think gratifying conversations. We have reached the end of our panel. Oh, so are you this out? Was that was that like last call at a bar? <laughs> that was last call at a bar. <laughs> you nailed it. <laughs> um, Jeffrey Reddick, Nicole Kahn, Stephen Israel, thank you so so much for this wonderful panel. Um, and thank you for having me. This was really wonderful. Thank you, thank you everybody. Great, great questions. Job. Great job. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Thank um, you. I wanted to say um 
Uh, thank you to the Producers Guild for hosting this panel, the LGBTQ plus committee, and everyone that helped put this panel together. Thank you again, Nicole Kahn, Stephen Israel, Jeffrey Reddick, and our lovely moderator, David Canfield, for the wonderful conversation. And thank you to everyone that attended, and we hope you had a great time with us. Um, and I hope everyone has a great weekend, and thank you guys all again. You guys have been great. Happy Pride. Yeah. Happy Pride, everyone. <laughs>